What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Diner Talks with James. Lucky number 13. Tonight, my guest is the one, the only, the incomparable Stacy Nato. We're going to bring her out here in just a little bit. She is a boss. I think you're really going to enjoy her. She calls herself a permanent, amazing, badass hype girl. I'm excited to talk to her about that. She's already got me hype just in general. Uh, she's got an infectious laugh and just a great human being. So uh, we're excited to have her on, y'all. If any of you all know Stacy, let me know. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think about her. Let's start to show her some love right now. But as always, as always, my friends, let's start off this episode with tonight's top three, top three. Now, I'm in a brand new place for those of you who are longtime listeners, first time listeners. Uh, I'm I'm home in, in Long Island with my family as opposed to being back in Minneapolis. Um, and I'm here, unfortunately, because I had a funeral to go to. Uh, but it was a beautiful ceremony. May my uncle Tim rest in peace. Uh, it's just always so special to get together with family and whatnot. Uh, but my friends, I'm back in New York and as a straight white male, there are very few identities that I'm allowed to be proud of outwardly. But being a New Yorker, gosh darn it, is one of them. And so here are the first three foods that I always make sure that I eat whenever I come to the great state of New York. All right, first off, first off, an egg everything bagel with bacon, egg, and cheese on it, light salt and pepper. Okay, come on now. Come on, let's go. Bacon, egg, and cheese from a deli, always fire. Next, I get pizza because New York pizza is the only kind of pizza. Stacy is from Chicago, but she can't say anything right now. And that is amazing because Chicago pizza is really just like tomato casserole. All right, now don't get me wrong. I love Chicago pizza. It's just not pizza. New York pizza, that's what we're talking about over here. I get my pizza with meatball and ricotta and a little fresh garlic on there. Tell your friends, if you ever try it, you're welcome in advance. And next, but last, anytime I come to the great state of New York, I got to get Mama Robolata spaghetti, okay? Watch your mouth. All right, next, these are the top three states. These are the next, these are the top three states that I would be caught dead in right now. First off, Georgia. Georgia. What y'all doing down there? How's it going? Y'all good? You doing well? Okay, cool. Cool. Great. All right, next. Arizona. What y'all doing down there? Y'all good? All right, cool, cool. And last but not least, Florida. Can we talk about Florida? At what point does Florida just like break off like appendages used to in the bubonic plague? I'm not sure if that's a thing that happens, right? But either way, Florida, come on, y'all. Let's go. Just get it together, okay? My friends, please wear a mask. Next, the top three body parts that I am proud of. This is a weird thing, but the reason why we're talking about it is because with Stacy, we're going to be talking a little bit about body image. Um, and, uh, and so I decided, and we're also going to be talking about confidence. So I decided, gosh darn it, what are three things I like about myself? So first off, for me, I have great legs, okay? You want to hold up this much mass? You got to have some toned-ass legs, friends. Let's get it. Wait till you see these calves. If I was flexible enough, I'd show them to you. Next, my eyes. Are you kidding me with these things? Come on there. They're like a steel blue. <laughs> Go on. I will. And last but not least are my hands. These things have never let me down. Read into that if you need to. My friends, those are tonight's top three, top three. I'm so excited to bring on our guest. Her name is Stacy Nato Kirsten. I think I believe that's her full name now. Um, I know her as Stacy Nato. That's where I met her. She is an incredible speaker, a powerful coach. Anytime she and I get together, it immediately gets into a deep conversation. So this is just like a normal conversation between her and I. You just get to creepily watch. <laughs> but she does amazing work. She empowers individuals to step up to the plate and take control of their lives. And she boosts individuals' confidence all around this country. And so I'm really pumped to bring her on right now. Y'all clap it up right now for the one, the only Stacy Nato. Yay! That was an amazing introduction. I love well, that. I mean, if you're going to identify as a hype person, I probably need to then bring the hype. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> I hope I give you some hype. I uh, You will always give me hype, that's for sure. 
Okay. Thank you. Oh, Thank yeah. you. I'm trying to figure out my hair over here. Yeah, well, it's just, really weird because everything on this camera is backwards. And so ahead. I don't know which way my hair is supposed to go. Yeah. It's, it's going, it's going the wrong way. There we go. Okay. There there it is. Is. There it is. Yep. Nobody touched the hair. Makeup. I'm alone. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> Stacy, what's going on, friend? How are you? I'm fantastic. I am super hyped to be here. Mm, and mm. Uh, I love talking with you always. And I completely agree. This is just going to be sort of a normal conversation between the two of us. And I hope people creepily love watching. I'm yeah. really excited about that. Get into it, y'all. Get yeah. into it. <laughs> yeah. Stacey, you know, this is called Diner Talks with James. And, uh, you know, obviously we're not in a diner right now, but you and I have enjoyed a, uh, a late night meal or two. What is your, in Chicago land, what is your favorite late night meal? Where do you go for it? What do you usually get as your guilty pleasure late night out with friends meal? So there are so many things. It really depends to your point on time of day, who I'm with, what event I've just come from. Did I have dinner before? How big was that dinner, etc. Yeah. One of the oddest, oddest diner meals I've ever had was after a concert. It was my best friend Liz and I. We went to Nookie's Diner and uh, we we decided Is that after a Limp Biscuit concert because that yeah. would have just been fitting. That would have been perfect. It wasn't. And I, <laughs> Liz will yell at me. I cannot remember what concert it was. That's but uh, we we just wanted everything. We were so hungry, so we went for pancakes, mm. chocolate milk, and grilled cheese with tomatoes in it. That is an iconic diner order, right yeah. there. It was. It was actually great. It was well played. So great. Anytime I'm in a diner, I get chocolate milk and I'm a grown ass man and I could give two shits. Tim does that too. And that's, and that's why I like your husband. Yeah, I, love so. it. I, love it. <laughs> I don't understand. Where is the point where we've decided we're too, too mature for chocolate milk? That's a world I don't want to live in. Agreed. Diners are there for you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks diners. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I love it. I love how you can remember the exact order that you all had at the diner, but you have no idea what concert you went to. That's that, <laughs> that's a very fair point. I would say it's because her and I have been together to a lot of concerts, but it's because obviously that meal after was just as Memorable. good, not better. Memorable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, speaking of gorging ourselves, Stacey, I want to talk to you about body image. Uh <laughs> yes, yes. We call that a segue in the biz. So, uh, so um, this is something that you are passionate about. Now, you were a part of the original. If I mess any of this up, please clarify. Uh, but you were part of one of the most original, uh, original, like controversial ads that uh, that happened um, in uh, in the two thousands. Uh, you were in Times Square on a billboard with your underwear for Dove. Uh, Dove's Real Beauty, is that what, it, is that what yeah, the campaign was? Real Beauty, correct. Real Beauty campaign. So uh, first off, most of America has seen you in your underwear. Yeah. Um, and this really profound campaign, can you tell us just a little bit more about that campaign and what that experience was like for you? Absolutely. So it's such a fun story. It's actually the intro to every program I give. And I'm walking down the street in downtown Chicago. I was a student at DePaul University and this woman starts approaching me and she's getting up close behind me. And I'm in downtown Chicago. I like to stay aware of my surroundings. And so I'm kind of looking over my shoulder and I'm thinking, what's happening? What's going on? Who's this person? And she gets closer to me and now I notice she's taking notes in a notepad. And I'm thinking, what is happening? <laughs> you know, what's going on? <laughs> and I walk in, I was walking to my part-time job. I was like a receptionist at a salon and she follows me inside and introduces herself. And she says, she's a talent agent and she wants me to come to a modeling audition. And I looked back at her and I was like, pardon? <laughs> Ma'am, what about this is screaming model to you? And I was, I was not only taken aback, but I was so like, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. And she started explaining and she's like, no, this is different. It's it's about real people and, and understanding beauty and sort of widening the definition of what we see in, in the media and starting to give women more of a voice and, and really reframing what we call beautiful and what we call acceptable. And 
I loved that part, but I'm still like, no. <laughs> so, uh, no, there's no way. I'm like, that's thanks so much. This is that's flattering, great. Yeah. And I walk into the back. My roommate had come with me. My roommate and this woman leave at the same time. My roommate takes this woman's business card, mm -hmm. calls, pretends to be me, makes oh. me an appointment to go to the audition, and forces me to go to the audition that next Tuesday. And the rest, as we say, is history. I, you know, I went through quite a few interviews after that. Uh, after the very first interview being pictures in our underwear, <laughs> uh, everything after that was video and, and telephone interviews and really right. getting to know who we were as women. And it, it became really comfortable really quickly. And then I got a call a few months later that I had been you know, asked to participate and I was really excited to participate. So we flew to New York, we did the photo shoot, we met the other women. Uh, and then we waited six months after taking the photos to figure out what would happen. And in those six months, we got a lot of research done. We asked, you know, Dove, the brand tons of questions and we really fell in love. I fell in love with the brand. I fell in love with how they were handling this conversation. I really fell in love with how they were using their power to yeah. move forward. Something that was very important, still is very important. And, you know, as, as many of us know that once that, once that party unveiling happened, it exploded. Uh, and the conversation is still not done. I mean, we're still yes. having the conversation. Yeah, that's so it's real. something that I remember at the photo shoot, we all were like, oh, cool. We'll be in a magazine for a month, right? We'll buy all the magazines and we'll we'll keep them and show them our, to our grandkids. And we still aren't done. And it, this has become not only my career, it's become my passion. The reason I really decide to help people and serve people. And mm -hmm. it's been a really fun it's been really, really honoring and fun to be part of this journey and to be able to serve in changing the conversation, the way women are represented in the media. Yeah. I mean, what a powerful ad showing women of all, all shapes, sizes, colors, everything's, yeah. uh, you know, in this, in this, in this badass advertisement mm -hmm. uh, for the world to see of like, you know, j how you are right now is good enough. Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously you were on billboards. You've also been in magazines uh, behind Stacy, as you, as some of you can see, um, this isn't just like a, uh, this, uh, this, this cosmopolitan thing. That's not just like, Oh, I went to like this office party and there was like this cool photo booth. And like my husband got on the front of the ESPN magazine. My friend got on Vogue. No, Stacy was actually <laughs> on the cover. Uh, <clears throat> at some point in time, Stacy's going to do a shoot with all of her clothes on. Um, but uh, I mean, she doesn't have to though, because <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but, but Stacy, the beautiful thing, the question that I have for you is that this is such a beautiful, uh, a beautiful movement that this campaign and it really started. But a lot of it came down to the idea of of confidence, being confident in who you are and how you look, um, and, and body image and, and whatnot. Before that woman creepily came up to you and said, "You will model for me now." Um, <laughs> before that happened, uh, like, would you have considered yourself someone who is really comfortable uh, in your skin? In that time, I was getting there. Okay. So growing up, no. You know, I call seventh grade, I lovingly refer to seventh grade as the year of the thighs because it's the year <laughs> that I grew into my I adult. I don't remember that one on the Chinese calendar. Yeah. I don't <laughs> I know <laughs> the rooster, the dog is the rat, year of the thighs. <laughs> um that I grew into my adult body early, and I grew into my adult body earlier than pretty much the rest of my class. And I don't know about you in seventh grade, but in seventh grade for Stacy, all I wanted to do was fit in and, and be like everyone else and be accepted. And for me at that time, I had equated being like everyone else as being yeah. accepted. And you know, all the cool popular stores that everyone was shopping at, I couldn't shop at because nothing fit me. You know, and I looked around and I looked at media. And I thought, well, they're all similar. They're all able to fit in. I stand out somehow. I must be the problem. Yeah. And in seventh grade, you couldn't convince me otherwise. There was no convincing me otherwise. Like I was fat. I wasn't good enough. I was all the things. And because I, I carry both my weight on the bottom, that's no secret. I still do to this day. You know, the thighs were the thing. Mm -hmm. And I... 
I remember battling every day with my clothes, with my mom, with everything, because I just, I would wake up and I'd open my eyes and the first thing would be, gosh, what am I going to wear? How am I going to feel comfortable today? Uh, there was a dress code at my school, certainly didn't help anything mm. because the code that was for people who identified as women certainly was different and harder to dress. Uh, it was harder to find those clothes that fit fit into those rules. And so it was just difficult. Um, and it took me a lot of people. It took me a lot of situations and scenarios to to work past that. And I certainly still have moments. I certainly mm. still have moments. Uh, so many people will talk to me after I do a program or I'm coaching somebody on body image and they're like, oh, but you're, you know, you're so confident you're this. And yes, I am. And that doesn't make it so that I never have a moment. It doesn't make it so that I don't have a full day, <laughs> sometimes a week. Uh, and I think it's important to be reminded of that is even people who are deemed body image experts somehow, we still have our moments. And I think it's important to remember that you can be confident and have your moments. That's important for me to remind, you know, everyone I work with and all the people in my circle, because yeah. it's real life. It's real life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people assume confidence is like, once you, once you uh, cross a certain point, you're like, I've now entered confidence land and I will be confident in every way. And that's not, that's not exactly it. It reminds me actually of one of my favorite quotes uh, by the wise old sage anonymous um, and anonymous once said, uh, happiness is only a place that you can visit, but the smartest people go there often. And I love that quote. It kind of reminds me a little bit of, of confidence in that way, or maybe my relationship with confidence uh, mm -hmm. is that, you know, confidence is a place that I have visited. <laughs> uh, I did not, I didn't buy a house. Uh, the land was real expensive. Uh, and uh, I was afraid I'd build it on top of a shame hole. So, uh, you know, I was like, oh, let me hold off. Um, but, uh, but still um, it, it's so interesting because you and I have had a lot of, a lot of conversations around uh, many, many a topic, um, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily talk a lot about body image um, and body image is often at the core of my self-esteem issues. Mm -hmm. uh, like as far as the way that I show up, the way that I cover up, right. I tell people I put this shell on. So then I think you'll pay more attention to the words than you will, how unattractive I am. Um, and they are, uh, my image around the way that I look is that's often when I when I get into my darkest points, it's also around that, like the 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 way that I talk to myself. Like Tina, my wife will will say, "Don't talk to my don't talk to the person I love like that." Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I'm talking to myself in a really negative way, uh, and it's fascinating because there is so much advertising, there is so much money made on low self-esteem around physical appearance, right? I mean, it's it's got to be one of the biggest markets in the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is predominantly pointed at women. Yes. Right, predominantly put, right? We've heard of pink tax, right? Like a, a women's razor that does the same exact damn thing as a men's razor. They both have three blades. They both got a squishy handle, um, but one is pink and therefore we charge five more dollars for it, right? Like uh, like pink tax is definitely a thing. The way that women's hair products, obviously makeup is astronomically priced. Um, and so uh, they're starting to get into the men's, uh, like men, the way that men look and care for themselves is starting to become more popular, right? Like Target now has a men's grooming aisle mm -hmm. um, and things like that. And like Harry's and and Dollar Shave Club and, and Old Spice, right? Like Old Spice tries to hit the nail on the head of like, what kind of man are you on? Now I'm on a horse. And so those kind of those kind of moments. But for the most part, men aren't spoken to. And, and, and certainly don't talk to each other about low self-esteem issues around body image. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as to why, why is that the case? Yes. So I think, I think we have the conversation. I think we have it drastically differently. Okay. And, and so for example, if we talk specifically about advertising, mm -hmm. 
it's so interesting to me when you really think about, so one of the things I really ask people to do, especially when I'm talking and teaching young people, mm -hmm. you know, I'm asking you, I want you to get really critical with your eye. I'm not going to tell you delete your Instagram feed and never pick up a magazine, but I am going to tell you to really turn up that critical eye. And I love giving some of those young people, especially sort of some behind the scenes of what happens in advertising, et cetera, like how much goes into that picture before you even see it. Spoiler, it's weeks and months of work on one photo. Yeah, sure, <laughs> and then yeah. when you see it, you're comparing your your whatever that moment is to that, you know, team of hundreds of people who have looked and fixed that photo somehow. Mm -hmm. And so the thing for me, especially if we talk about advertising specifically, is you you really brought it up and you you put it beautifully, which is if we're advertising to men. We're asking them, if you buy this product, you're just gonna be more manly. You're just, wow, look at you. You're just such a sight. You're such a you're such yeah. a hero. And when we ask women to buy a product, it's like, nah, you got a little better and here's the next one too. And so for me, it's sort of like, we already are setting it up like this. And so that's the advertising conversation. When we talk about just, our circles, our people, when we're sitting at a diner with friends, right? We talk about confidence and body image differently because I believe we've taught men that you're not supposed to really talk or worry about that. And I believe we've taught women, you're definitely supposed to talk and worry about that. Sure, yeah. And I think there's also a piece where you know, we, we've taught men inherently have confidence. It's just something you have. It's something you've been given along with your privilege. And while in moments that's true, in many, many, many moments it's not. And so I believe, and I, I don't identify as a man, but I believe it must be difficult if you identify as a man and you look around and you think to yourself, well, I'm not super confident right now, but I've been told I should be, so what's wrong with me? And in fact, we just create a new shame cycle. Um, and so I, I it it bothers me because it's it's definitely all across the board. I won't yeah. pretend to know what it feels like to deal with confidence as you know somebody who identifies as a man, but I will be able to hold out my hand and say, I understand how you feel to be said you're supposed to be here. And if you don't meet this, then you're not good enough. I can understand what that might feel like. So I think the conversations are there for both, but we've just had them differently for such a long time. Uh-oh. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah, that's so powerful. That idea that uh, that we believe that men are taught that they should be or not men are. Oh, can you hear me? Got you now. Got you now. Are we breaking up? Is it me? Is it you? Who's breaking up? Someone let me know in the comments. <laughs> Someone let me know in the comments real quick. Stacy, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you now, James. I don't know what's happening with the audio. Oh no, you don't. You don't at all. <laughs> all right, are we good? I, I have you now, as long as you've got me. Awesome. Let's figure it out. So, um, <clears throat> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> that's exciting. I like when you can hear me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's interesting when you talk about confidence with with. As far as with men, when you talk about confidence with men, the idea that uh, the idea that men are just kind of born and they're supposed to be confident is very interesting because that's not the case. And but everything around us tells us that that's it, right? That's why that's why we shouldn't be vulnerable. That's why we shouldn't share. That's why we shouldn't cry. That's why we shouldn't lean on, ask for help, and stuff like that. Um, and so. In those moments, we miss opportunities. We miss opportunities to teach men that it is okay if you are not yet as confident as others think you should be. I don't know if this is my audio or not. 
if you are watching, can you let me know what's going on with the audio really quick, just so I can better prepare? Like I said, I'm in a new space, so thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I would appreciate Yeah. I've got a completely frozen James. I can see live comments as well. Does everybody else have that? He's coming back, Tina says. Hang tight. Does anybody mind telling me? Ah, hello, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. It's me. Damn it. It was me. Um, <clears throat> thank you, friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you do the speed test. You do the speed test and you're in your, in your Wi-Fi at your Airbnb, and it says it's going to be good. Um, but apparently not, my friends. <laughs> ben there. Ben. Did you hear what I said about confidence? I believe I got it. <laughs> oh, no, that's terrible. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so, Stacey, it's so cool that you talked about, you know, confidence in the way that that is for men um, and for men, because uh, the, that idea that men just come out confident, that we are just like put on this planet, it's like you are confident. Um, that idea that, uh, that men can't, uh, you know, could not be anything but confident. And that's something that that swagger that's bred into us. That's why, you know, men are, and that's why men ask for higher pays. That's why men negotiate. That's why men do all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's very interesting because in that same vein, it's also why men never ask for help. That's also why men are afraid of the word vulnerability. That's also why men um, don't talk about things like body image and whatnot. Um, men are taught never how to be confident because it's just expected that they are. Yes. And that is something that doesn't do any part of society a favor. That does not help men. That does not help women. That does not help uh, people who identify as other than men or women doesn't help anybody um, out there. And so uh, that's such a powerful point that you brought up. So for you, uh, so for you, when you are, when you're thinking about that, you know, you have the opportunity to, to talk to men around the country about confidence. What kind of things do you hear from those men afterwards? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I used to be surprised by the amount of men that came up to me after mm -hmm. a program or a session. And I'm no longer surprised. I, I'm so excited about it. But I had to check my own <laughs> biases and preconceived notions, et cetera, because I used to be shocked if they came up and wanted to talk to me. And I, I talk, I, I give the same program. My language shifts just a tiny bit, maybe some of my examples, but I give the same program because we're talking about things like inner critic, imposter syndrome, vulnerability, you know, how you feel in your body and how that does pour over into different parts of your life, different ways you lead, the ways you partner, the way you parent, you know, all of the different facets that you might have. And so it's it's no longer shocking to me and it's so amazing to me to to see the people who come up to me after many men saying wow i hadn't thought about it this way and many will say to me i've never given myself permission to think about it that way hmm. and so i think for so many people in audiences it's breaking the patterns that you've had for 30 40 50 60 years it's uh, releasing some of the things you've been taught in your family structures and the way you grew up. And it's taking back some of your power and deciding what would I like to step into the next yeah. space and do? How would I like to talk to myself in the next one? Now I get to decide. And that that's a power conversation, right? But that's an important piece because power is magic. I believe what we have in ourselves and the power we all hold, that's our magic sauce. And every single human being has that.
But how do you get, I mean, I agree with you and I love sauce, so I'm really here for that. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I agree with you. Um, but it's so interesting because the, the inner critic is louder. The inner critic has a way bigger microphone, right? Like they're that annoying dude behind you at the baseball game that you're like, really, this is where, this is where my seat is right in front of this dude. Um, right. And so, uh, like that is, it's so tough to turn off that inner critic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know for me that that is something that I have, that I've always struggled with, right? Like it's the classic example that you hear, you get 10 comments on your YouTube video or your Facebook post. Nine of them are glowing best post in the world. Oh my God, you changed my life. And one person's like, meh, I don't know. And you're like, Oh God, I'm, why have I ever posted anything in my life? I'm the worst, right? That inner critic has such a, has, has their hand on the volume of your confidence. Um, and it's so interesting. How is that? I mean, how have you been able to kind of quiet that inner critic? And I know, I know it's every day. It's not, it's not every day that you're able to do it. Some days that inner critic wins, but you know, I mean, how, how do you do that? Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a toolkit of things <laughs> and I pull things out as I need them. And it depends on the situation and the day and the night. But, um, you know, to be honest with you, my inner critic gets the most quiet when I get the most fed up with my own BS. And it's often, it often takes me 20 times being successful to finally convince myself I'm okay at something. <laughs> yeah. And then maybe it's 60 times successful to be like, oh, I'm good. I can actually charge for this now, et cetera, right? And that is important for, I think, everyone to understand is, is we all have it. For me personally, I work really hard to fact check the inner critic. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's writing down and, and really slowing down to think about some of the things that are happening and then understanding them, yeah. reminding myself that all of those thoughts are trying to motivate me. So at the very, I really, it, it helps me to remember that that inner critic, it thinks it's helping. <laughs> it's trying oh, yeah. to motivate me. It's trying to keep me safe or it's trying to push me this way or what. So I, it helps me to be like, okay, reminder, this is trying to be helpful and you are no longer being helpful. So I'm gonna fact check you. Is it true that I've never been successful at XYZ? Yes or no? Yeah. Usually it's no. Usually I've been successful at something I've tried in this department. If yeah. it's actually like, it's true, I've never been successful at this, it's often because I haven't even tried it yet. And so what an amazing, amazing person in both of our lives, one of my coaches, Amber Chris, said to me a, a long ways back, and it stuck with me, is she's like, Stacey, you don't really have to trust you're going to be great. You just have to go try it and collect information. Hmm. And that hit me and that sticks with me. And so now it's more this playfulness. It's this curiosity. Instead of putting pressure on myself, hmm. it's, well, will this work? Let's try. We're not going to know until we try. Let's get curious about it. Let's let's give it a shot and let's go collect more information. Because remember, if I'm sitting in my power, I'm collecting information of, do I like this or not? Does this serve me or not? Is this good in my life or not? Not, you know, do other people think I'm good at this or not? <laughs> and so that to me, it's like, let's go out and collect the information before we start to talk ourselves out of it. That's powerful. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to let, I'm trying to let that hit me because I am so quick to be like, nah, don't do that. Nah, that's not you. Nah, that, that someone like you couldn't do that. Shouldn't do that. Uh, or wouldn't do that. Right. Like, uh, especially as I compare myself to, uh, to some of my friends that are uber successful, right. That have, that have these, uh, amazing jobs working for NASA. One other guy's inventing a brand new kind of telescope. That's going to be able to learn, see deeper into the universe so we can figure out how this whole thing started. Right. Another one of my buddies, a, a civil engineer who handles the tunnels under New York city. Right. And, uh, and so like, all of these individuals where you're constantly comparing yourself, it's like, well, I'm not doing X or I'm not doing Y. Um, and even growing up, 
growing up, I remember, you know, I was single for a very long time. I didn't have, uh, I, I didn't have my first kiss till I was like 21 uh, or 20. I didn't have my first girlfriend till I was 21. And, uh, and I always told myself, I was like, no one, you know, no one likes you that way. You're not dating material. Um, mm -hmm. you're not like, you're just always going to be in the friend zone, which is not a really kind term, but it's still like that, you know, that's what I called it back then. And just like, uh, you know, you're always going to be friend zoned. Uh, you'll probably be alone. And, uh, and so, you know, those are the thoughts that would come up because, uh, you know, I, I had backing facts behind them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I never, it took me a long time to get out of my own way and be like, oh, wait. But all those really brilliant friends that I have, they come to me for relationship advice, for conflict advice, for whatever advice, you know, and, uh, and, and so, and, and like these individuals, you know, as I started to meet people who were potentially interested in, in being in a relationship with me, it's like, yeah, maybe I'm not that smoke show oozing sex appeal. Like, yeah, I want to date this guy, but instead it's like, yo, no, you're just a good man. And people marry good men, um, mm -hmm. right. People marry good people. But in the beginning in high school, I don't want to get married, right? Like I wanted to make out with somebody. I wanted to just like learn. I wanted to explore my sexuality, yeah. right? And so like I didn't give a shit about that. Um, like, and so, uh, and so I, I wrote all these stories in my head and it took me a long time. Like even when I did finally start dating um, up until now uh, where, you know, I'm in a relationship where I still need to be convinced where I can be wanted, right? Where I am, uh, that I am, that I'm smart, that I deserve what I have or, or whatnot. It's, it, so I hear you about that idea of like, you know, we gotta, we gotta try to figure out ways to silence that inner critic, to fact check that inner critic, but it's tough when you have the ability to build such an argument on the other side as well, right? Like yeah. <laughs> your negative self-talk is an extremely good lawyer. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. And, you know, we've talked about this before, you and me, James, offline, but, you know, we know science backs this argument up, which is we know our brains are pre-wired to go to that negative thought patterning. We know that 90% of our thoughts are on a habitual loop, right? So it, I say those things, especially to the people I work with, because I want to make sure you know, you know, it's normalized behavior. It's okay. You're fine. You're good. You, you fall into that space where your brain is just trying to motivate you. But just because it's easier doesn't mean it's serving you. Just because it's easier to sit in that space doesn't mean it's going to allow you to go live that next step that you're really dreaming of. Mm -hmm. And when you finally, or, or when you, I shouldn't even say finally, I, I don't like that term, but like when you get to that space where you're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, I've been given this a lot of attention and power, that's a magical moment. And then that moment, I truly believe every human has it to some level. And that moment, in my opinion, is what kind of propels you to that next space. That's important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is important. <clears throat> uh, and I love that. Uh, that sounds like a really great place for us to jump in to our next segment. Let's go. Let's oh, not these two again over here. Okay. All right. Break it up, you two. Enough of this here now. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. You're not smiling now, are you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> really good at accents. <laughs> All right. Apparently we're getting a little bit too deep. So, uh, <laughs> Stacey, <laughs> Stacey, let's lighten it up. Let's lighten it up a little bit. This segment is called things you didn't know about me, but are now grateful that you did. You've seen the show before. You know how it works. I'll mm -hmm. share something that is random about me. Uh, and then you can share something that is random about you. Sound good? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so every single time that I have pizza, every single time that I have pizza, I have to have it with root beer. I think root beer and pizza is one of the sexiest food combinations in the history of food combinations. And so uh, that is a random fact about me. That is a fantastic random fact. <laughs> I used to do that as a child. I love that combination. Uh, this is a very random also food fact. I eat my salad after my dinner. 
I do not, like an Italian, like an Italian. I do not eat my salad before dinner. And I didn't actually know that was Italian until people started pointing it out and recognizing it in me. But yeah, I save it. I wait. Now, if we're at like a very formal occasion where one thing's coming at a time, very rare that I'm in that position. But if I'm in that position, you know, <laughs> socially acceptable, I want to still fit in. So I'll eat it. But if we're at home, if we're somewhere more comfortable, like I save it, I eat it as if it's dessert. It's not in place of dessert, but I eat no. it as if it's dessert. <laughs> you know? What is your favorite salad dressing? Ranch. That's the most Midwest thing you've said this this show. Um, <laughs> Another quirky thing, I like to mix ranch and balsamic half and half, equal parts. Very good. Ranch and balsamic. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go, friends. That's yeah. the, I, don't, I have never had that. I would try it. I do ranch and ketchup. People do, people judge me for that. Cranch. I like that. I'm, in, I'm into that. <laughs> Cranch. Great. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really learning a lot here. This is really yeah. important. This yeah. is really important. <laughs> uh, here's another random fact about me. It is uh, it is summer. Summer usually means getting in the water. I love getting in the water. I'm a cancer after all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Um, but uh, it's a Finding Nemo joke. People catch up. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, I love getting in the water, but there is one moment that I hate. And now Minnesota, Minnesota is a big lake country, right? You know this, you come from lake country as well, being a Michigander. Um, and, uh, and so, but I grew up on the ocean, um, pretty much. And so, so some friends had boats, but in general, I, I love getting in the water, but I hate getting out of the water, especially, especially if I have to get on a boat because I am petrified that I do not have the upper body strength. There's just not enough rungs on the ladder, right? Like I need an extra rung for your boy. And so, yes. and because I'm a taller guy too. So it's like wonky. And then I'm like, I don't know. And like, then someone's got to like grab me. And it's just, it's just, it's just see previous conversation. Like I just, I don't want to call any attention to my size. Um, it's bad enough. I'm swimming with a t-shirt on. And so, uh, so still, yeah, but that, so that is one thing that every time this, this past week or for July 4th weekend, we went to Tina's parents. Now uh, they have, they have a little house on a lake. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a little paddle boat you take a paddle boat out to the center of a lake. Again, a little lake. Um, you take a paddle boat out to the center of the lake. You drop the anchor on the paddle boat. Maybe it's 20 feet deep or something like that, whatever you jump in and in order to get back, then you, you have to climb back up on the paddle boat. Now I'm a large man. Okay. Not even <laughs> insulting myself. Okay. I'm just a lot of man yes. and physics are a thing. And so <laughs> if I try to get up onto said paddle boat by myself, said paddle boat flips. And so I actually needed Tina to be a counterweight. It was really, I'm glad I was just out there with her because I, I don't think I was ready for my mother-in-law to see all that. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% uh, <laughs> uh, understand what you're saying. I get mm -hmm. that. Totally. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. You got that in though. You're good. Did I you did. Yeah. That? Okay. No, I got, we figured we, we, Tina helped me out. Tina helped me out. Yeah. <laughs> Tina's always there for you. I She's good it. like that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so where am I going with this one? So I was actually for a brief moment in time, a hype girl for a professional dance company. And I would actually go to events and get the crowd going and excited and have some fun. And that is not something I tell many people. So uh, I, see, I know some people watching right now are just laughing because they know that about me. But that was like a very fun part of my life. And it was just sort of warming me up for the work I do now, right? Like, but I would, I would really was for a short period of time in college traveled with this company who would do events around Chicago and I would go and get the crowd excited before the group came out and sang and performed. And, uh, you know, if no one was dancing, I'd make sure people were out there having fun. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't hard for me. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> I've known you for almost 10 years. I had no idea about this. So yeah, this is truly idea. a fun fact. That is so fun. like what, like what kind of events are we talking about? 
mostly, you know, small private parties or like bar performances, small venue performances. There was okay. this group in Chicago and and they played 90s covers of hip hop and just fun, everybody knows the song type music. And yeah, before they'd come out, we'd make sure everybody was excited and going and, and it made a difference. People were out on the floor when the when the band came out and was excited yeah. to go. And yeah, she the woman who was in the band was a professor of mine because senior year of college, I took aerobics, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so she was my professor for aerobics and we had dance a few weeks and she was like, hey, do you have any interest in coming and helping us a few weekends? And I was like, you are speaking my language. I would love to do that. <laughs> so that's how it happened. <laughs> I love it. I, yeah. lo I love uh, that you were out there hyping people up, playing 90s hip hop, out there, dare I say, giving no diggity while you gave them eargasms with your mellow accent. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that is correct. That is correct. If you don't get that reference, I don't know if we're friends, mm -hmm. slash, I. We're just old, um, but <laughs> um, yeah, I love it. CD single in my six CD changer in my car old, you know? <laughs> perfect, perfect, yeah, for sure. Yep, yep, I like the way you work that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll keep going, I don't care. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a super fun fact. I can't wait to see photos. Wish I had one right now. I would show everybody exactly what that looked like. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's amazing. So, so you went from, uh, from, from being a professional hype girl, um, to now, uh, to now you are a, uh, exemplary coach. Um, you are a, a life coach and I'll let you tell a little bit more of exactly how you define what you do as a coach. But, um, this is awesome because in our friendship, one thing I've always appreciated about you is that a, you've never hesitated to call me out on my bullshit. Um, and you've also never hesitated to ask me a really good question when I really just wanted to hear your answer. <laughs> uh, so that's annoying. Stop yes. that. Yeah. Stop it. Um, but, uh, but still, uh, it's like, no, just fix it. Just tell me. Yeah. Um, and you're like, let me follow that up real quick. I just one more question. Just one more. Um, so, but what drove you to being a coach? Right. I think, I think it's amazing because you're effectively still a hype girl. I hope you still have the nineties hip hop in your coaching. Um, but, uh, but still, uh, you know, it's, it's funny the way some of these random jobs that we had, kind of look a little bit like what we do right now. I know it's not exactly on paper, but it's funny because you're, you truly are, a, coaches are hype people um, for individuals to help them get out of their own way. But I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what you do as a coach and why, Absolutely. yeah, how you talk about it. Yeah, the foreshadowing is not lost on me. <laughs> uh, so how I became a coach is interesting because I, you know, started my career uh, primarily in speaking and only speaking and people would start to approach me and say, do you do coaching? Do you do inner work? Can we dive deeper into this? And I would always respond, no, no, I don't do that or, or whatever it may be. And it was, it was my story. It was exactly how we've already, already said, which was, no, that's, that's not something I could do. Mm -hmm. uh, no, there's no way anyone would actually a pay me for that. B that would it, you know, what would I say to these people? How would I quote fix them? And it took lots of stuff, lots of my own unfolding, lots of fact checking my own stories, et cetera, to really realize that, you know, I think actually one of the things about me is that I, I can help you see a different lens. I can help you see a different view. And uh, I, I, I have this ability to kind of come eagle eye point of view and say, well, what about this? And I'm looking at it kind of from this angle, et cetera, or ask you questions. And so... I decided that would be fun, uh, but I decided it would be something I needed to do because I had my son, Bennett, and I wanted to travel less. And so it didn't work at first. I didn't have any clients at first. And that's, I truly believe because I decided, well, this is something I have to be doing to be home more. Yeah. Instead of stepping into my full power of, no, I, I'm good at this and I serve people in this position. And so when I finally was able through my coaches and through lots of work, et cetera, make that shift, that's what helped me kind of fully step into, yeah, I'm a coach. This is amazing. And I can do this. 
Yeah. What we do and what I really care about is helping you as a client remember the power and the capability you have in yourself in order to fully step into all the facets of your life. I ask clients always to bring everything to the container, your life, your work, right? Your relationships, everything. Because when we can really help you pull it out and remember how much capability, how much amazingness you have in you, you know, you fully step into a different part of your life, a different like chapter that, you know, we see real transformation happen when those yeah. shifts occur. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's beautiful. And I, I want to come back to that, but I want to go back to something that you said earlier um, where you had said that, uh, that, you know, one of the reasons why you wanted, where you were excited about starting coaching is because you had your son, Bennett, shout out to Bennett. Um, <clears throat> great little man. Um, and so it's fascinating because women are, there's a lot of pressure on women who, uh, who there's a lot of pressure on women, period. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and leave it there. Right, a lot of pressure on women, and um, there's also a lot of pressure on women on being a specific type of mom, on what a mom looks like, and how much a mom uh, should do for their children, how present they should be for their children, what the word independence should feel like uh, for a mom, right? And and people are very quick to assign that to women. Uh, and I mean, uh, dads get it as well, but nowhere near the scrutiny uh, that women get it. And women get it from all angles. They, they certainly get it from men. They also get it from each other. Um, and, uh, and so I'd be curious because you, I mean, you were, you're crushing the speaking game, right? Like you were really, you had a lot of things, amazing, amazing things that were going for you. Um, but but in that moment, you made the decision to like, I've, I would love to figure out a way to spend a little bit more time with my son. You know, was there, was there societal pressure to do that? Did you feel that? Did anybody question like, like when, you know, when, when people found out you're pregnant, we're like, well, you're gonna stop traveling, right? You're like, you're gonna stop and like put everything down and be this amazing super mom now, right? Like, what, what are some things that people said to you? How did that weigh on you? And, and ultimately, how did you make that choice for your the, for yourself and your family? I was, even being, a, you know, somebody who is immersed in this world of women's issues and empowerment and feminism and all the things that go with that, mm -hmm. I was astounded, astounded at the amount of times I was asked, are you going to still speak? Can we still book you? Are you going to still travel? Are you still working? I mean, I, I was I was blown away. Mm. And I live in this world and I understand the situation and I understand the pressures and all of the labels and the, the understandings that people put on us. And I still was blown away at the amount of times I was asked it. Uh, and so during my actual pregnancy, up until the time I couldn't travel any longer, I was still speaking. I was still doing as, as best I could. I got, you know, I got pretty sick during my pregnancy, but as best I could, I was still working and getting all these questions. And I would, I was mad. I was so pissed that I was getting these questions to the level I was getting these questions. So during pregnancy, especially, I was like, uh, hello, working, you know, badass mom over here. That's what I'm going to be. That's the title I hold. And I don't, I have no clue. I'm almost... I'm almost offended you would think otherwise. And that's sure. the space I was in. And uh, then Bennett came in, you know, into life with us and uh, everything shifted. Mm. And the next thing I was astounded at was the level of mama bear energy that came with him. Mm. Okay. And I was up to that point certain I was going to just get right back on the road and it was all going to be okay. And it took me quite literally James years to kind of calm some of the anxieties of leaving him yeah. and some of my postpartum, the way it came out, which is something I believe we don't talk about in this way. We talk about postpartum depression quite a bit, but I really think we need to talk about the postpartum experience because it comes out in different ways. And for me, it wasn't necessarily depression or what depression usually looks like. It was straight anxiety. And I wanted to just, pull off in this like room and, and no one ever hold him but me. Mm -hmm. And I have an amazing partner. He was with me a hundred percent. It was understood. I was going to get right back on the road. It, he's, he's, he's a very much involved partner. There was no question of how this was all going to look like we were going to figure it out together. And I wasn't giving up my work, but it took me a while to get back to my work for that reason. 
And so yeah. then it became, well, everyone's forgot about me, right? I'm not in the game anymore. Uh, and I, I gave away a lot of my power to this story that mm. be, my work didn't speak enough for itself that my work wasn't good enough to hang there for a little while because you hadn't seen my face, because you hadn't seen the dove girl, you'd forget about me. And luckily that was a story I fact check and found I was incorrect about that yeah. the work itself is transformational enough that it held. Uh, but it took me a while to get over that story. It took me a while to, to really get back to what I wanted. And then the reality of the situation was is I wanted it to look a bit different. I certainly didn't want to give anything up, but I needed for my sake, my own, my own mental health, I needed it to look differently. And so then it was sort of this new challenge, like, all right, now, how is it going to look? What is it going to look like by still being able to do this work, by still serving people and humans and people in the things I love to do? Yeah. What will it just logistically look like? Uh, and luckily we were, were able to figure that out and we're, we're kind of grooving back in it. So now I have some different boundaries around travel. I have some different boundaries around speeches. Um, it certainly helped me value my time and price my time a bit differently. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and so sure. it, it was in the end a really helpful situation. But that is kind of the progression of that for me. And yeah. I, I, I talk about it as much as I can now. It was hard for me to talk about in the beginning only because I could. it was hard for me to kind of name what was happening. But now that I've gotten a little farther away, he's almost five. Um, hindsight was helpful for me to, to name it. And I talk about it now because I think it's one of those things that, you know, it was shocking for me to feel that way. And I don't think enough, or, or it, not that it's anyone's responsibility to tell me about it, but no one told me that that could happen. And yeah. so I think it's important that women especially share their experiences because then we can help each other out and and hopefully not feel quite as alone. Because I thought I was alone in those moments. I thought there's no way anybody else feels like this, <laughs> which we know is untrue. But in that yeah. moment, it felt real. Right. I mean, so many new parents feel alone, right? They've read, they've, they've read, Every single book, even if their uh, parents-in-law are there in the house or whatever, like they just like they still, it's still an extremely isolating experience, is what I've yeah. heard from all all new parents. Yeah. Um, and so, for you as someone who teaches confidence, um, what what did it feel like to succumb to some of those other thoughts? Like like what like you know, what did that spiral look like for you? The name of the one down, uh, not as much the one up. <laughs> it was life changing spiral. It, yeah. it, it single handedly threw me completely off my track. And the thought that became obsessive was you were, you were doing so well. How did you fall so far? How did that happen? How did you let it happen? Right. And so that's where the beating myself up and shameful downward spiral came into play because it was like, you know, had I just tweaked something here and there, I'm sure I could have kept this going, Stacey. If you would have just calmed down and handed him off to somebody and went on those few trips, you would have been okay. Yeah. And so it all became me. It all became my problem and yeah. my fault. And the, the root, deep rooted fear became, I'm not going to be able to be as good as I want to be at all the different hats I hold. And that became the next thing that I needed to really unpack. And, you know, we talk all about so much, like, can you have it all? Can you find the balance and yada, yada? And it was a, a really influential, uh, she's a speaker, she's a podcaster, she's all these amazing things, Amy Jo Martin, who sat on one of her podcasts, you know, I don't think it's about balance anymore. I think it's about finding the rhythm. And understanding that rhythm means it's going to change and it's going to shift just like the radio or the music does. And in that, you know, as things do, it hit me in the perfect moment that I really needed to adopt that. And so I started thinking about the rhythm. What's the rhythm going to look like now? What's it going to look like next week? And reminding mm -hmm. myself that whatever it looked like now didn't necessarily have to work in six months. It just has to work right now. Mm -hmm. And it, and that helped so much. So it, it, it was hard. I am not going to lie to you. The people closest to me know that I had to really claw myself out of that spiral. Uh, and thankfully, because I knew some of the tools before the spiral, this one spiral happened, many spirals have happened in my life. You know, I knew it was important enough to get out of it. I knew it was important enough to claw my way out. I knew that a, the work I do is important and b me having fulfillment and feeling content 
is really important. And so I was able, of course, with all the help of my people, you know, tools, all the things I was able to kind of come back around. Yeah, that's beautiful. I want to come back to that, how you did that. Um, but one other, one other quick follow-up question is that, you know, is what kept you in that place? Would, would you say that that was predominantly the postpartum and the symptoms that you were having there and the fact that you didn't even know that you should talk about it because no one else had talked to you about it, that it might even be a thing? Um, or was it more of like, societal pressures of like, well, this is what a mom is supposed to be. And this is what an entrepreneur or, or this is what an entrepreneur is supposed to be, or this is what a badass woman that's trying to make other badass women is supposed to be like, you know, what, what, what were the loudest voices in your head right there that were kind of keeping you, keeping you down, keeping your head under the water? I sincerely believe it's a healthy mix of both. So okay. my postpartum questionnaire at my doctor, six weeks post, you know, my, I had a C-section. So C, six weeks post my C-section, I'm doing the little questionnaire and it's like, have you felt more sad? You know, it, mm -hmm. it's five questions and that's it. And I, as long as I marked what they wanted me to mark, nothing ever came up about it. Yeah. Now I'm not putting any blame on that. That's an entirely different conversation. However, one thing I know for a fact that is the case with postpartum in my experience yeah. is, you know, whatever is happening is so damn real in those moments. It's very difficult, at least it was for me, to separate. This must be postpartum thinking. Right? Like, no, A, you're going through an entirely different and new experience. So yeah. everything is real. B, of course, we know there's biological shifts and hormonal shifts in the body. So yes, of course, we know that's happening. But there aren't moments. In fact, there's not even energy to pause and go, hmm, this must be that thing. So I think it was a definitely a healthy amount of that. And it was for certain a healthy amount for me personally. What do strong entrepreneurial women who love their work do? Yeah. They hold the baby in the Instagram feed and also story while they're still talking about their work. But look at me just beautifully also feeding my new child. Yeah. And I did not have the energy to do that. That was not something I held the capacity for in that moment. And you weren't going to catch me Instagram storying. And now <laughs> because I'm feeding your, your kid is beautiful because I just literally did not have the capacity. So that is what held me there. You know, you're not doing the yeah. thing that the strong entrepreneurial woman who's also a mom does. Um, and you, you don't have what it takes anymore. That's kind of yeah. what was holding me there. Yeah. And yeah. That's powerful. Thank you uh, for that moment. Um, I, I think that it's, it's incredible that you were able to come out of it, right? That your self-awareness that you mentioned that you had you used some different tools, whether those were, you know, peers, counselors, friends, your partner, um, all those kind of things. Uh, and so, and just obviously also just the internal work that you were putting in uh, to get out of that. But the, such, there are so many people who are just stuck in that rut of like, well, I guess this is just the way it is, right? Like, I guess this is my lot in life or like, oh, okay, well, I guess this is what I am. Um, and that is in complete contradiction to what you teach and how you teach. Um, and so the fact that you were there, um, even while you were teaching some of these things is really beautiful, right? I've, I've said on here before, I wrote a book about authenticity and vulnerability while I wasn't being that with my first wife, right? Like, like while I was not so, and, and, uh, you know, I can get up and teach things all I want. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that I'm also taking the medicine when I get off stage. Um, and so, uh, but for you, uh, you were able to kind of climb out of that and, and climb out of that and start to figure out. And, and you said something really powerful before. I love, I love the analogy of like, it's not about balance anymore. We we have to stop looking at life. Like we're trying to keep a whole bunch of plates spinning. Instead, it's about figuring out which of these plates freaking matters, yes. right? Which one of these plates matters. And so you did a lot of really awesome prioritizing yeah. um, to get, and then found your rhythm based on the priorities that you set forward. Um, but how do you pick priorities, especially as someone who is looking out in the world and being like, 
And in a world where the word busy is sexy, right? In a world where it's like, we well, got to be doing everything. Look at this person. They just went to the Maldives and then they had four children. They adopted seven more. They marked for Black Lives Matter. And now they're making themselves a quiche, right? It's like, it's like how'd you do that this week? Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like in that world, uh, in that world, how do you, uh, how do you, I guess, figure out what your priorities are and how did you decide this is what matters to me? And, and that means that these other things in saying this matters to me, what I'm also saying in the same breath is these things do not matter to me anymore. Yeah. That's almost, it's almost harder to say these things don't matter to me anymore than it is. These things do matter to me. Yes. Uh, agreed. And so I decided to adopt so when I sort of got to this space of, cause I believe this is an important space. And I actually believe when you say there are so many people watching or listening or out there in the world that stay in this rut space. I actually believe that space is often, you have enough self-awareness to know something's missing, something's off, something's not great, but you aren't exactly sure how to get to the space you want to be in. Yeah. And it's often because either you've never been in the space you want to be in, you have no idea what that feels like, or you, you've gotten so far into a different space, it's hard to find yourself in that next space or take that next step. So mm -hmm. for me, I had gotten to that rut. Like I knew something wasn't working or whatever this was, wasn't working. I had enough awareness to know that, but I wasn't really sure what to do. So I kind of did what we talked about earlier, which I was like, let's start testing some things out. Yeah. And so for me, it became, let's live in the hell yes only. So if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. And there's no in between. And for me, there was a lot of stolen energy in the limbo. Well, should I do this? What should I think? Oh, what if we try that? And, uh, there was so much, so much going to that, that it was stealing. It was stealing my power, stealing my energy. I had nothing left in me. So it, it became this, let's practice. Let's just get, again, let's get playful with it. Let's just try. If yeah. it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no and keep moving. And that helped me quickly shift into how does this feel? Do I like this? Does this light me up? Is this a hell yes feeling or not? Because then what that did is it helped me lead with how I'm feeling, not what does this all look like? You know, it didn't have to look like yeah. Stacey, the badass entrepreneur, and also mom is making it happen. It had to feel good. Yeah. And that, when it became that, it has to be a hell yes, otherwise it's a hell no, it helped me lead with that instead of what it all looks like. Yeah, that's powerful. And what a great, uh, what a great exercise to say hell yes or hell no, right? I mean, there how many people, how many of our friends do we wish use that while dating? Um, <laughs> Yes. Is this person a hell yes? <laughs> they probably need to be a hell no then. Um, <laughs> right. 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 Like, or, you know, I guess have some fun, but then it's hell no time. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, that's so powerful. Uh, and I, I love also this idea that we choose what to give power to. You alluded to this a little bit earlier, but we choose what to give power to. Um, and, and the amount of power that you give to those negative th uh, self-talk, the amount of power that you give to that, uh, what is a ideal entrepreneur look like? What is a badass mom look like? What does a, you know, uh, a strong independent woman look like? What does, uh, what does a confident man look like? What does an attractive man look like? Uh, and, and so we give power to those moments. Yes. And for so long, I gave up a lot of my power and I think I still do it a little bit to this day. A lot of that comes in the form of accommodating right now um, where it's like, you know, that that's where, that's where that inner power struggle often shows up for me um, yeah. is, is in that, is in that uh, accommodating phase because I still have a deep desire for people to like me. Please please like me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. And so that, that's where, that's where some of that still comes up for me. Um, but I, I love what you were sharing just about that idea of, of you determine where you give your power. How are you doing that, uh, right now in your world? 
So my rule of thumb is 75% of my power has to stay with me at all times. That's my rule of thumb. And so 25% goes. And when I talk to the, the little people in my life and I teach them, I call this your esteem team, right? Like who's on your team? And your mm -hmm. esteem team are those people who have your back no matter what. You know, as adults, we usually know who these people are. And if we don't know who these people are, I, you know, we got to find them. Your, your team's important. Your people are important. And so for me, even the 25% I give out isn't a, a, a like, it isn't a doormat way of giving power. It's, it, it's a mutual shared power where it's like, I love you. I believe in you. And I know you have my back. So yeah. if you call me out on something, I'm going to listen to you because we've exchanged some power and I'm going to really give you the benefit of that doubt. I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause. I'm going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean like if you have, if you're on my team and you have 5% of my power of the 25% I give out and yeah. you disagree with me, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm just like, you're right. I'll do exactly as you say. Right. Cause that would actually be giving away more power. So for me, it's like, it's that it's, 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 literally visualizing like I'm powerful. I get, I get to know what feels right for me. And it took me a long time to not second guess what feels right for me and really just sit in it instead of not second guessing it. And so it's, it's coming back to my own decisions. It's asking myself sometimes 60 times a day, what feels good right now, what yeah. feels right in the moment. Um, and that's how I really sit in it. And I, again, I always tell everyone, like, don't don't give away more than 25 percent. Right? We want majority with us and, and rule of thumb. But it's important to think about if you've given power away and more than 25 percent off in in the past, go back and get your power. Yeah. If you've been in a romantic relationship and you gave that person some of your power and that romantic relationship is no longer happening or you broke up, go back and get your power. Don't be sitting scrolling their Instagram feed, right? Like, don't yeah. like go back and take that power back. Like we leave it so many places and we give it to so many people that don't have our back. Um, and it, it's, we don't have room for that anymore. We don't have time for that anymore. It's time to regain it and to keep it with you. That's how yeah. I do it. Right. I mean, it's like Hamilton taught us, right? You got to get your right hand man back. You know exactly what I'm saying? Right. Exactly. And then you got to put the thought into the letter, but the sooner the better to get your right hand man back. Right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, I love, I love that. I can deal with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for you, uh, for you, first off, that idea is beautiful and I love it. Go get that power back. Right. Like get it, uh, keep it only give out 25% on days where you don't succeed. Mm -hmm. On days where you give more than 25%, how do you feel and how do you know that's what kind of a day it is? Just for individuals who are like, okay, I don't know. Okay. I don't know how much, per I don't know where my percentage is right now. Absolutely. Right. Like, so how do you determine when, what, it, what, what, what does one of those days feel like for you when you give out too much? Almost always it feels like I cared so, so deeply about what everyone thought. Uh, maybe I made a comment that I'm now completely reanalyzing and wishing I hadn't said. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about a comment where I really hurt someone's feelings and I need to go back and apologize and own it. That's that's different from what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, oh, you kind of put yourself out there and you made the group laugh. And now you're like, what was I thinking? You know, what did my hair look like when they all looked at me? Right. Like mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about. That's that'll happen to me. Uh, or I talked too much and I didn't listen enough. Right. Or, or I said, I shouldn't have said my opinion then. I should have just held it here. And so it's like that over analyzing of everything I did or said mm -hmm. um, in a judgment space, not in an observation space. And so that's a big thing too. Like I can observe my day. That's much different than like judging my day and judging the heck out of myself. Yeah. Um, and I, I often will feel just completely energy like bankrupt like I have nothing left and I'm almost grumpy I'm like get away from me you know like I don't I'm not making you dinner and I'm not getting you milk and I'm not putting you to bed like get away from me you gotta put yeah. your weight around here you five-year-old yeah. take like, the trash I out you know where the fridge is like go and like, that often means I gave too much away because it's 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 definitely in my team that my son gets a lot of my energy right and so in sure. my power and whatever it may be so like it's often that space and I'm just not there. So how I do it is I, I'll sit down and like, I forgive myself for buying into the belief today that I didn't do enough and I gave too much away. Tomorrow's a new day. I'll try again. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that took me time because it sounds so like easy and simple, <laughs> but it, it is simple, but it doesn't necessarily make it easy. Um, but I try really hard to just like, I wash away today and I'm going to try again tomorrow. Yeah. 
right? Yeah, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Stacy, uh, you are a true light, my friends. And I am I am grateful on those days where I'm a part of that 25% that you give out. Thank you uh, for those moments. And thank you for giving us, uh, be, letting us be a part of that 25% today. Uh, if you all have some questions for Stacey, I would love for you to put those into the chat. You want to talk about confidence. You want to talk about parenting. You want to talk about coaching. You want to talk about any of those kind of things, uh, self-esteem, body issues, and whatnot. Not. Ask some of those questions in the chat. We're going to hang out. For those of you that are here tuned into the podcast, thank you so much for listening. As always, if you are interested in hearing that Q&A, feel free to type my name in on YouTube. Find this episode with Stacy and give it a listen. Uh, thank you so much for checking out on the podcast. Stacy. thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Thank you for having me. This is a blast. Hell yeah. I appreciate so y'all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> podcast listeners, please make sure that you like, that you subscribe, uh, and please rate this just so people, other people can hear about it because Stacey deserves to be heard by more people. Uh, I appreciate y'all. Thanks so much. Tune in to the next episode. All right, Stacey, uh, let's go, uh, let's go on here and let's see what kind of questions we got. First off, uh, first off, this is, uh, this is fun earlier. Um, the concert that you went to, uh, I mean, what hurts the most is that you forgot that it was Rascal ah, Flatts. Rascal Flatts. Liz always remembers. Liz, Liz always remembers. remembers. <laughs> yep, for sure. For those of you that stuck through my tech issues, thank you so much. Tina saved the show today. And thank you so much to Tina on that. Um, <clears throat> for sure. you got some love. My boy, Kevin Sabar showing you a little bit of love on here. Uh, Elise showing some love as well. Uh, and my brother confirming that that moment was indeed awkward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, John Robolata. <laughs> so, uh, Kristen, uh, Kristen Cardis, Kristen Cardis is a quick question. Uh, so first Kristen. off, I'm going to let, I'm going to let you, uh, you know, I, I intentionally had you muted before, uh, because it's my show and I can do that. Um, but go ahead and try to defend Chicago pizza right now, Stacy. Uh, <laughs> unless you uh, think New York's is better. <laughs> I do. I do think New York is better. I'm just going to put it out there right now. I do. So I'm with you. I love Chicago pizza. You have to have Luminati's, not Giordano's. That's a huge debate. Uh, I love it. But if I'm truly thinking pizza, I'm with you. I'm thinking a New York slice of pizza. You know, mm -hmm. New York is is just good. It's just too good. And then Chicago is like a pie. And I love that too. But to your point, that's not what I immediately think of when I think of pizza. It's a tomato parfait. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know I like a parfait. You ever meet somebody who said, well, I don't want no parfait, man. I don't want no parfait. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Shrek. <clears throat> uh, and there you go. What's your favorite toppings on pizza, if any? I'm a Hawaiian pizza gal. Oh, and that's where you lost me. Cool. Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have tried yours. I'm going to try that. I'm gonna try perfect. That. Perfect. Um, since Tina saved the show, uh, and she asked a great question, here we go. Yes. Um, so how do you teach kiddos confidence? So how do yes. you teach young people confidence? Woo. Okay. This could be, we could talk about this for hours more. Uh, and, and I would say this it's, it's first and foremost, it's, uh, honoring children enough to make sure you are understanding how they tick. So what I mean by that is I don't multi-parent. I parent one child. I can only imagine what it might feel like to multi multi or to parent multi, you know, different personalities, different children. But one of the ways we do know confidence is instilled is honoring as a parent or any sort of figure leader in their life, you know, that you see them, that they are seen, that you know that they're a little bit quieter than maybe some of the, the people in their class or their siblings, et cetera. So first off, honoring who they are as an individual is extremely important. Doing your best to remind yourself as a parent or a guardian or a, you know an influence in their life, uh, you're there to guide, you're not there to shift or change. So of course, we're teaching our son right now, you know, you don't hit just because you're frustrated. So of course, I'm trying to change that. <laughs> but I'm not necessarily or ever going to try to change how he shows up in the world and how his emotions come forward and all those things like that's him. And I'm going to be here to honor that and to guide that. But my job is not to um, change or mold that part. Uh, the single best thing I believe personally you can do for kids and their confidence is honoring every emotion that comes across the table. 
Mm. Seeing it, hearing it, understanding it, and then doing your best as a figure in their life to help them work through it. Should they be looking for that? You know, we talk so much with adults, like often people don't necessarily want a savior. They just want somebody to listen. Yeah. Kids are often the same way. Um, and, and if they ask or if we feel the need that they're, they haven't navigated this before, let's teach them. Yes, please. Like advice is needed in parenting. But, you know, we, we don't give them enough credit sometimes. So give them a little bit of, of that rope and, and try to give them some some movement and some power to do that. And my biggest thing is uh, I would really try as best you can to display choices. So if you give them, if you're in a scenario where you really believe this has to happen, you give them two to four choices and you they pick. They might not like all the choices, right? We're going through a little bit of a spurt right now in our house where he'll, he'll turn to me, Bennett will turn to me. I don't like any of those choices. Fair. I hear you. And I'm still the parent. <laughs> so here are your four choices. But I'm empowering him to remember he still has choice. That helps him remind himself that he has ownership in what he does in this world. And he has to take responsibility for what he does in this world. That's important in our household for parenting. And so those are some ways I would say it helps to remind them, you know, they're confident. And even if they don't like their choice at the end of the day, then we help them navigate through that because we all have had those moments where we don't like our choices. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. Judy, I'm going to come to your question in one quick, uh, one second, but just as an, a quick addendum to that, you know, how do you make sure that they're not overconfident, right? Like we've all, we've all seen that kid at the pool where it's like someone needs to get knocked down a peg um, or right. Or like uh, what's her face in uh, Willy Wonka. I want it now. Um, right. Like, like how do we make sure that we, uh, you know, that we, that we not necessarily keep them humble, but I would say keep them somewhat grounded because it's a fickle balance. Like you can very easily wreck someone's self-esteem with a passive aggressive or, or an aggressive or, uh, you know, whatever type of con uh, uh, type of comment that can stick yeah. with them for a long time. Um, but so it's a weird, it's a weird balance, but uh, yeah. How, what would you say to that? So I Baruch would say, Assault, thank you, Kristen Cardis, Baruch Assault. Um, <laughs> yeah. I would say it comes back to those choices again, giving them choices helps them a little bit more and differently to think through things and how they're processing the world. Uh, boundaries, of course, in my opinion, are important. And I think the biggest thing to this point is vulnerable parenting. I, it's hard, but you will find me saying, I'm sorry, I just raised my voice, Bennett. I'm sorry, I yelled, Bennett. I got really frustrated. I wish I wouldn't have raised my voice. And so it helps, in my opinion, to, to remind him like we're human. And I just owned that I wish I wouldn't have acted that way. I said it out loud. I kind of just took that on. And it helps us level, I think, everything to the to the ground and to the level playing field of we're all human. There's no one above anyone. And even though I'm, yes, in charge in this household and, and I have rules, I also make mistakes and I'm vulnerably showing you that. To me, that helps kind of check yourself a bit like everyone's here in the same boat, right? Or, yeah. you know, similar boat. We all are human. We all are, are you know, worthy. And so to me, that's important. So it's the choices, the boundaries, and then just like vulnerably saying, I, you know, I wish I wouldn't have acted that way. I'm sorry that I did. Right. That's, that's important to me. I wish I, I wish next time I'm going to try different. I'm going to try harder. I'm modeling to him how I hope he acts when something like that happens to him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Jess, Jess is on board with that. Yeah. Uh, I cannot wait to uh to talk to my parents about this because i think that is uh, for, that's new style parenting right like i don't believe that is that is not the way it was done um and uh you know it, it, a lot of because because i said so right and like and there's there's some value to because i said so as well right like um cool. it's not you can't it, almost kind of using your same exact example from before you can't give the kid all the power. That's right. another way to make sure the kid stays humble, right? Like there's a hierarchy here in this household and yes, we're humans and we care about humanity. Um, but like brush your damn teeth. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's a balance. So yeah. Um, Judy asked a really good question. Judy, thanks for your patience. Um, so when you talk about, uh, taking the power back, are you doing that mentally, privately, or actually involving some of those people? Yeah. Hey, Judy, I'm glad to see you on here. Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, um, I, 
I hope this isn't feeling like a cop out answer, but I think it does depend on the scenario. And so if there are moments that these people are still in your life, that it's that this particular situation is still nagging at you, bothering you, et cetera, then I say that there probably or could be an opportunity to go back and actually have a conversation with that person. 80% of the time, I'm speaking in just sort of a privately mental moment where you're doing that for yourself, for your own good, for your own mental health, et cetera, things like that. It's like I have a client who uh, you know, had a relationship end. Uh, we were just talking about this a few months ago. And they are no longer talking to that person. In fact, there's no longer even an opportunity to talk to that person. And in this particular case, she didn't feel like she had closure in that relationship. And so we walked through, like, how do you give yourself closure, right? How do you have that private moment? Um, and so I think there is an opportunity to do all of those things. But 80% of the time, I'm recommending, like, it's your own sort of mental visualization, private moment that you walk yourself through that. Yeah, I love that. It's interesting. I'm in a situation where, you know, from my previous marriage, uh, there is there are times where like I want to know how she is doing, right? And just like I care about her as a human. Um, and uh and so like there are moments where it's like I wish I could reach out, like because she just had like uh, her her dog just passed, one of her dogs just passed away, and uh, and and that I was very close with that dog, right? Like like was there, met the dog as a puppy, and was very involved in the dog's life for a long time, and so it's just a great dog, and like the fact that I can't reach out is very interesting. And so like, I'm all, I'm almost on the other side of what the example that you just said um, is like where I am. And this is something that I've gotten better at. I don't think about this daily and that's, you know, time, time heals those kind of wounds and whatnot. Um, but, and also another great relationship that came along. Um, and so, um, but, uh, but still there are some, you know, there are some moments where it's like, you know, I wish, uh, I, I wish I could, I wish I could let you know that like, I'm a good person. And like, that was a moment that happened. And, you know, I wish it could have been, uh, I wish I had handled it differently. Um, but like, you know, just think I'm a good person. Uh, but like, that's just also me, right? That's me projecting, like me needing to remind myself, you're a good person. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I hear you. And I, you know, I think, I think your self-awareness is always amazing. The self-awareness in that piece is I know this about myself. I'm I want you to know I'm a good person. And James, I would also argue that you're a person that likes to know to show people they're seen. Mm -hmm. And in a moment, especially in loss or trauma, like you're hopeful that that person is seen and by you, by somebody who is at one point very important person in in their life. So I hear you. I think I think. That's important. The awareness to understand the intention behind reaching out is also very important. Yeah. Facts. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> facts. And that's where I'm grateful for my family. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, for sure. Um, Tina asked another question. And, and if anybody has any other questions, make sure you get it in here. Otherwise, I think this might be the last one. Um, but uh, Tina asked a question. What uh, What are both of you extroverts missing most <laughs> during quarantine? First off, here's my thing. Are we still calling it quarantine? I think it is, right? We're still in quarantine, right? I, people aren't throwing around the quarantine language. Is it still quarantine? I certainly feel like I'm quarantined, but yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say we're still in quarantine. That's what I'm still. We doing. certainly should be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> should be for sure. I'm calling it yeah. that still, yes. Okay, great. What are you, uh, Stacey, as a fellow extrovert, what are you missing the most? Yeah, right I'm, ah. Uh... You've had the opportunity to see a lot of family, um, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, but I'm, you know, what, what are you missing most right now? That helped so much. Uh, so it, it's going to be a twofold situation. Uh, I'm a hugger. I really miss, I, I realized how much, and, and maybe I got to check myself with this, but I realized how much I just uh, went in, in for the hug. I almost always did. And so I miss that. I really miss, nonverbal cues from people since we're all responsibly wearing our masks. Uh, even just in the grocery store, again, I'm not going too many places. I'm going pretty much to the doctor's office and the grocery store, but those nonverbal cues, like I smile at everyone. Can everyone see I'm smiling? You know, like things like that. <laughs> I miss that. I miss that connection and the feeling of connection. Um, I find personally, at least around here, uh, 
people are a little bit more afraid to look at each other and, 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 you know, have those little moments and, um, man, I just hope we get that back. That would, that would hurt if we didn't get some of that back. So I hope that that comes back that I miss. Yeah. How about yeah you? I, I think a lot of society is learning just how community driven we are. And there are many cultures that knew this, um, but the United States, I would not say is one of them. Um, and, uh, and I think, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see the way change, you know, uh, the way that plays out. I also extremely miss hugs. Um, I just, you know, I don't know. I'm a hugger. It's a way that I show love. Uh, it's also a way that I receive love. <clears throat> and so, uh, so I just, I like, I pride myself on being a good hugger. Gosh, yeah. darn it. Uh, hugger. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> the other thing I would say uh, prior to this week is, uh, is I miss my family. Um, this is the longest time I had ever been apart from them is, you know, almost, you know, seven and a half months almost uh, or seven months. And that was, uh, that was really hard. Uh, and, uh, and, and not to say that we saw each other, you know, even weekly, but uh, I just, I just really miss seeing them. I um, mean, there were plans for us to get together at, at various, at various times. I was supposed to see pretty much every pocket of my family at some point in the last few months, at least once. Uh, and that's been really hard. So, I mean, you know, it's a shame that this funeral happened, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, getting to be with my family right now has been really refreshing and just trying to like soak up the moments, um, has been, has been great. Um, so yeah, so I, I would know. say, yeah. Um, those are probably things I, I think, I think what you just said is also really astute about the, about the nonverbal cues, right? And don't, that doesn't mean we all need to go buy those creepy ass masks with the smiles on them. Please like don't. those, please don't. That's, that's <laughs> terrible. That's, I mean, I can only imagine what people with fears of clowns are feeling about those masks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah. Uh, but it is right. Uh, it's, it's also interesting. I was talking to my parents today and they were, you know, this, this idea of like, what are kids learning right now? Right during a really important developmental time, what are children being taught? Right yeah. of like, well, don't oh, don't go don't go close to them. Don't go right like. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see what this generation's like growing up. Um, if they lean the complete opposite way, right, and we become this massive hugging culture. I'm in, uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> or if it starts to look like Wally, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, right. And go that complete direction. So yeah, um, it's a we shall see. Yeah. Stacey, thank you so much. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you for having me. You're amazing. I appreciate really? you coming through and kicking it with us. Y'all do me a favor. Clap it out for your girl, Stacy <laughs> Nato Kirsten. Um, and uh, we, we're not allowed to get applauses anymore in the virtual space, but we'll, well some people throw some claps in there for you. Um, but uh, Stacy, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Your vulnerability, your wisdom, your candor, your questions are always on point. Uh, thank you for making me better. And thank you for making us better today. I appreciate you. Huh? appreciate you a lot. Thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Be well. My friends, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Diner Talks with James. I'm James, uh, but I hope that you will come back again next week. We're here every Wednesday, nine o'clock Eastern, six o'clock Pacific. Uh, please come through. You can watch it on YouTube, Facebook Live, wherever you'd like to, but it would be special to have you jump in. And my friends, until then, May you keep being authentically curious with each other. Let's keep asking questions. Let's keep diving in, especially during this time that people are pushing us apart. Let us try to bring ourselves a little bit closer together. Y'all be well. Take care. Stay wonderful. <laughs>